Welcome to Woodvale. My name is Yvonne, and it's great to be in church with you today. If you are a first-time guest, I'd like to take a moment to welcome you to Woodvale. We're so glad to have you with us for today's service. Please visit our website and fill out a Connect card. We would love to have an opportunity to connect with you and get to know you. If you're here on site with us today, drop by one of the guest tables in the lobby after the service. There's a group of hosts there who are excited to meet you and answer any questions you have. Our hosts have a gift card waiting for you to a coffee shop and will be making a donation to Chiu on your behalf, just as a way of saying, thanks for being with us today. As we begin our time together today, I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet and join us in a time of worship. Good morning, church. Welcome to Woodvale. You guys excited to be here this morning? Worship our King. Come on. Let's give him all the praise this morning. Amen. Come on, sing us out. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for thee? How did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles?
God. We believe it, Father. You are more than able.
you provide. I have all that I need. You are all that I Come on, I keep praying. Oh, I keep praying. You keep moving. I keep praising. You keep proving. I have all that I faithful. Thank you, Jesus. God, we praise your name this morning. God, we praise who you are. We worship you with everything we got this morning, God. Thank you, Jesus. And blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. And blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on, we sing. Sing if you love his name. Every chance 
bless I get, I bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty. Bless God with the praise that costs me. Bless God when nobody's watching. Every stance I come on, sing it out.
have on the go. We are in God's house and we are in his presence this morning. And there is nothing better than that. We're going to pause. We're going to pray. We're going to continue our worship through prayer. And uh, let's do that. God, we just give you thanks, Lord. We thank you that you are our Abba Father. God, we thank you that you know us so intimately well, Lord, and that you can see through the flaws that we have. You can see us for who we are. You can see us as your children. And God, today your children are gathered here in your presence. And we just seek you. We seek you, Lord. We seek what you have for us here today. God, bless the remainder of this time together. Bless us, we ask. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Today is Mission Sunday. We take a, a four-minute missions feature. We are honored today to have one of our global workers with the Pentecostal Sons of Canada. We support 28 global workers. This is one of them today. This is Jeff Kelly. Come on, give it up for Jeff today. Give him a warm Whitbell welcome. And he is serving in a restricted access nation. So go ahead and share, Jeff. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Good morning, Woodvale Church. It is fantastic to be back here. I say back here because this is where I grew up. And things have changed a little bit since I was a teenager. So the gym doesn't quite look the same and the green room isn't there anymore. So, uh, yeah, it's great to see what God is doing here. And uh, my family and I, we've had the privilege of living overseas for 15 years in three different contexts, restricted contexts in North Africa, in Middle East, and in Asia, and the last five years giving strategic leadership to Mission Global and to RAN, many of our workers who are in restricted places around the world. I'm here to give you a great report this morning. God is at work. Come on. It's harvest time, and what God has been doing around the world to see the growth of his church take place is nothing short of incredible. As we think about it, it's really captured by this image of a combine, an incredible season of harvest, so much so that in the modern missions movement, in the last 100 years, the shift has taken place from North America and Europe as the center of Christianity to the global south. There are more people who are now followers of Jesus in the places that we used to send to than the places that we're sending. That is good news because Jesus is building his church. Now that doesn't mean that we get to sit back. As a matter of fact, the impact that we have seen is incredible. Over, probably about 3,000 workers have been sent in the last 100 years from the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. You are currently supporting 28 of them. Thank you so much. And yet, it's not time to sit back and relax yet because there is more to be done around the world. But we can't get enamored with the way we do things because that combine, as incredible as it might be, if we're going to go to the places that still have to be reached, it's not going to work in the rice terraces of Asia. And so can you imagine taking a combine and trying to go and, and put it into these rice terraces? It's just not going to work. And so we have to find creative ways to go. And so when we are looking for those who God may be sending, because God is still calling, amen? God is calling people, and God's calling people like you. You see, we're not looking for necessarily Bible college students to be able to go. Yes, we'll do that. But many of the places that we need to be going to, 70 of the countries that no longer allow missionary visas reflect 4 billion people on our planet. we got to go to those places. And so it requires us taking those from gap years to golden years who have skill sets, who have education, who can take their jobs and go with them to be able to see the advancement of the kingdom in places where the gospel is restricted because there is about one-third of the people who live in places where the church is so small and where the gospel is restricted that we've got to still go to those pioneer places I want to ask you to continue to pray about 32 years ago there was a group of people who gathered and said let's begin to pray in earnest for the Muslim world how many of you have prayed during the month of Ramadan with a 30-day prayer guide yeah, there's some of you who would know exactly what that's about. And since that concerted effort in prayer, there have been incredible numbers of Muslims who have come to faith. And we have seen it in every house in Islam that there have been thousands and thousands who have come to faith. God is doing something unprecedented. And so we need to continue to pray for the Buddhist, for the Hindu, and for the secular world that God would see, we would see breakthrough in those places yeah. as well. So I want to call you to prayer. 
November 3rd is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And so as we approach that in this coming month, I want to ask you, would you pray for those that we know who are currently imprisoned in Africa because of their faith and who are awaiting trial? I want to ask you also, would you pray for the three families whose local Asian evangelists were martyred this year and yet their families with joy continue to serve Jesus knowing that one day they will be reunited in eternity. So I'm going to ask you, would you pray for the persecuted church, for the church that is reflected by those places where the gospel is restricted and where it takes creativity to be able to go to those places? Let's not become enamored with our combine. Let's wonder at the power of a seed. The seed of the gospel that's planted, that dies, that takes root, and that brings forth a harvest 60, 70, 100 fold. We had the joy of being able to plant seed in North Africa, in a place where there was one believer and a million people. And just this past summer, again, we were able to support them. There's hundreds now who are believers there. But this summer, another 30 people went to a camp, ended with baptismal service, those who are coming to know Jesus for the very first time. Thank you for your support. God bless. Amen. This man is the real deal. And Jeff, we're proud of you. God's used you in a great way. We love you and Sarah and your family. And he didn't share this, but Sarah, his dear wife, is walking through some health challenges. She needs a miracle from the Lord. And we're going to pray for a miracle today. We sung about a God who can do the impossible. Amen. We're going to pray for that. The church family, as you sacrificially give above your regular tithes to general missions, it helps us to support these 28 global workers. We want to thank you for that. And uh, so would you extend your hands towards Jeff? God, we lift up this man today. We lift up Sarah. We lift up their family. You have placed them, God, globally around the world and parts of the world that have been resistant to the gospel. But Lord, you have done miracle after miracle in these countries. We say thank you. People are being saved and changed by the power of a living God. Would you continue that, Lord? Be their provider. Be their encourager. Give this man ongoing fresh vision. We lift up Sarah to you. We speak healing in her body in the name of Jesus. That you would raise her up and make her well in Jesus' name. So thank you, God, for this man of God. Thank you for this global worker. We pray blessing over him. We pray for those he is ministering to that you would reach down and touch each one. We ask it by faith. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together again and honor, honor this man, amen. One second, Jeff. We love you, buddy. After this service, he's going to be at a table in the lobby. Drop by, say hello, and he'd be glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Jeff. Turn your attention to the screen. Good morning, Woodville family. I am so excited to be in church with you today. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., we have a special event for our Woodville seniors called Building Into the Future. Join us for an evening of worship, a special word from Pastor Mark, and an update on the expansion from one of our board members. To sign up or get more information, visit woodville.ca slash sign up, or you can call the church office. And do know the cost is $5. All right, calling all pie lovers. Our Woodville Junior High is hosting a Thanksgiving pie fundraiser to support their fall retreat. You can pre-order at woodville.ca slash sign up and then pick it up on Thanksgiving Sunday. Thank you so much for supporting our junior high ministry. And lastly, if you came prepared to give today, there are several different ways for you to give here at Woodville. Visit woodville.ca slash give for more information. Or as you exit the auditorium today, there are offering buckets at the door and debit machines in the lobby. And as you give today, let's take a moment to thank our Heavenly Father for everything that He has given us. Enjoy the rest of today's service. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning to each and every one of you on site and to the many who've joined us online in our church family and uh, our many guests from across our city, our nation, and from around the world. We are so honored that you joined in today. I want to give a shout out welcome to all of our guests on site. Can you give it up right now? Come on, for all of our first time guests on site. 
And if that's you, we are so delighted and honored that you chose to be here today. We hope you feel at home. We hope you come back. But would you allow us the joy of blessing you today, our way of saying thank you for coming. At the end of the service, go in the main level lobby. You'll see banners. You'll see the word guests drop by. Really friendly people there. We want to give you a coffee card for a coffee place that's all across the nation of Canada. We want to give you one of those cards. And also on your behalf, we're going to make a donation to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario on your behalf. Next weekend is Thanksgiving. That means turkey, potatoes, gravy, stuffing. Come on, how many stuffing lovers are in the house? My hands are the first to go up. Apple pie, apple crisp, it's going to be great. But next weekend, we've been in the habit of doing a special community offering for our city. We have set a goal of $70,000. We're going to share with you next Sunday about 10 hot spot areas in our city of Ottawa where crime rate is the highest and poverty is the highest. These are neighborhoods that I drive through and I weep over because the needs are so great. And we're going to partner with 10 churches across the nation, across this city, that are struggling and in need of help to reach the lost and reach the needs of the poor and the needy and share Jesus. We're going to strengthen their arms, not just with dollars. You're going to hear more about next week of how else we can help. I don't want you to miss it. And I've got a word in my heart from the book of Jeremiah. It's stirring in my heart. I can't wait to share it. But uh, just if you feel the Lord nudging you even in advance to give towards this $70,000 goal, above your tithe, you just mark Thanksgiving and it'll go towards that. Favorite question. I love asking. How many wonderful people are now ready for God's word? Come on, you're ready for God's word. Amen. Amen. Well, you've been standing for a while. Would you stand one more time? I want to pray in just a moment, but let me introduce our sermon title, give you a few thoughts that will set the tone, and then we're going to dive into the scripture. We're going to talk about a guy in the Bible named, you've got to wet your lips, Mephibosheth. I know, it's a tough name. I ask your forgiveness for throughout this sermon when I mispronounce it because my lips are getting dry. Mephibosheth. We talk today about the Mephibosheth mindset. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to get there. Then we're going to go to 1 Samuel 18 for a moment, 1 Samuel 20 for a brief moment. Then we're going to land in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to learn today about the Mephibosheth mindset. And there were four things about Mephibosheth that gave him a negative mindset. Number one, the name Mephibosheth means from the mouth of shame. From the mouth of shame. Can you imagine if your name meant shame? Everywhere he went and he announced his name, it meant shame. Second thing we're going to learn, that at the age of five, he was crippled and he spent the rest of his life lame. He couldn't walk. He had to be carried as a young boy. He had to be helped everywhere he went. He was crippled. The third thing we're going to learn is that he lived in a a city or town, actually a town called Lodabar. Lodabar was 70 to 80 miles outside of Jerusalem, but Lodabar, lo means no, and Debar means thing, no thing, nothing. Anybody like to be from a place that's called nothing? He's from nowhere, nothing, obscurity. And his name means shame, and he's crippled. And it got into his spirit so much that when the king spoke to him, he said to the king, I'm nothing but a dead dog. I want to declare today, nobody in this house is a dead dog. You are a child of the living Lord. Amen. I said, nobody in this place is a dead dog. You're a child of the living Lord. And I believe God is going to break a mindset that started in your head, got into your spirit, and it's been controlling you. And Jesus is going to break the Mephibosheth mindset in Jesus' name. So come on, lift your hands all across this place. God, I believe there's a word Help me to articulate it with clarity. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. And I pray nothing would stop what you desire to do in Jesus' name. Everybody shouted, amen. Amen. I said, everybody shouted, amen. Amen. Y'all put your hands together and give a loud clap offering of praise. Come on, come on, a praise to our God. Amen. Amen. Well, take a seat in God's presence. There are four... Mephibosheth moments that I want to camp on, and I want to give you just four thoughts today. The first Mephibosheth moment is the crippling fall, the crippling fall. And we're going to learn today and be reminded that like Mephibosheth, uh, it's already started, hasn't it? Like Mephibosheth, every one of us are way 
more broken than we think. Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall and Jesus is just putting us back together. Some of us, our brokenness is more revealed to us. Some of you are blinded by your brokenness, but everybody has brokenness. Maybe it's a trauma that you went through. Maybe it's an abuse that you experienced. Maybe it's a divorce that's happened. Maybe, maybe it's an anxiety or a fear. I don't know what it is, but everybody carries a level of brokenness, and we're better to admit it because church isn't for perfect people. It's a place for the hurting. We're broken people on a journey to wholeness. So I, I want you to think back to the end of 1 Samuel and Saul was the king of Israel, and there was a big battle going on between the Philistines and the Israelites, and Saul is the king of Israel, and the Philistines are winning the battle, and I'm telling you, they're beating up the Israelites so much so, so that King Saul was killed in the battle. Not only was King Saul killed in the battle, his son Jonathan, who's the father of Mephibosheth, was, was, he died in the battle, so Saul is dead, the king is dead. The prince, who's the king in waiting, Jonathan, is dead. And in that culture, when an army takes over God's people, they would want to get rid of the rest of the royal family for fear that the enemy would kill the rest of the royal family because they'd never want one of the children to rise up and usurp their power. So, so look at 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, because, because here's a window of what happened the day that the Philistines were defeating the Israelites, and Saul is dead, Jonathan is dead. Look at verse 4. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan, who had died in battle, came from Jezreel. So his nurse picks him up because she didn't want Mephibosheth to be killed by the Philistines, and she, she flees. I want you to picture her running down the stone steps of the, of the palace to, to exit the palace and run way far away so the Philistines wouldn't kill Mephibosheth, but she trips on the stone stairs probably. As she hurried to leave, and Mephibosheth became disabled. His name is Mephibosheth, the name out of the mouth of shame. He's crippled. He's lame. For, for up to five years of age, he's, he's a royal son of the king. Every day he would get up and he'd play in the courts as a king's son, but now he's crippled. And the nurse was running and she fell and, and, and he's crippled. And, and some of you today, you're going, that's my story. I feel crippled. I feel bruised. I feel broken. I feel beaten up emotionally. I, I feel like the battle is over. I, I feel like I'm in low to bar in the place of nothing. I, I feel like I'm a dead dog. And I, I don't feel like anything's going to change in my life. And we're broken people serving a God who can put us back together. Because how many people know there's hope in King Jesus? Come on. How many people? People know there's hope in King Jesus. There's hope. The second Mephibosheth moment I want to focus on, number two, is the king's plan. Number one, the crippling fall, and we're more broken than we think, but please get it in your spirit. We're going to see today that just like Mephibosheth, we are more pursued by the king of kings and the Lord of lords than we could ever imagine. We're going to read that King David pursued, chased after Mephibosheth. And I want you to get it in your spirit that, that Jesus is going after you. You can run, but you can't hide. He's going after you. He's chasing you down. He's making the move towards you. Come on, someone get it in your spirit today. He is going after because he loves you. He cares for you. You matter to the heart of God, and he will go to great lengths to get you. He went to great lengths to get Jonah, who tried to run from God. I could give you story after story in the Bible where God went to great lengths, and we're going to see that King David chased down Mephibosheth. And I want you to get in your spirit. You are pursued by the heavenly God who loves you. He is chasing you because he wants you, and he wants He, You matter to God. No, your eyes haven't seen anybody who doesn't matter matter to God. Everybody matters to God. He's chasing you down. Amen. So let me take you back to 1 Samuel 18 for just a brief moment. Jonathan is the father of Mephibosheth. David was the king who followed Saul. Saul hated David because all the people loved David, but David became the king. So look at 1 Samuel 18, 1-4. After David had finished talking with Saul, Saul's still the king, 
Jonathan, who's the son of Saul, became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he loved himself. Now, I'm just going to debunk some crazy teaching that's out there, because you're going to hear some verses of the love of Jonathan and David to each other, how they loved each other like they loved themselves. And there's a, there's a horrible theology out there that would want to conclude that David and Jonathan carried a homosexual relationship. I'm just telling you, you've overread the scripture in Jesus' name. There's just a covenant love. There's just a brotherly love an honoring brotherly love of a covenant between each other. Don't let anybody overstretch the scripture. It's out there, but I just debunked that in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number two, from that day, Saul kept David with him, and he did not let him return home to his family. Verse three, and Jonathan made a covenant with David. Now, covenants are never broken. Covenants are eternal. And Jonathan, the son of Saul, makes a covenant with David. Saul was intimidated by David. He's the king, but everybody loved David. They sung his praises. But Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Verse 4. This, look what he did. He, Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing, and he gave it to David. That wasn't an ordinary robe. That was the royal robe of the prince. That was symbolic that the prince would become the king when the king died. The son would become the king. The prince was in waiting and he's wearing the royal robe. He's next in line to be king. But out of a covenant relationship, Jonathan takes off the royal robe and he does something prophetic because Jonathan wasn't going to be the next king, David was. And he gave him the royal robe. And not just that, his tunic, which was his garment that kept him warm. But watch this. His sword, his bow, and his belt. No soldier would give up his sword because that was his defense mechanism. But, but Jonathan gives David his sword. It's like he was saying, I trust you with my life. You're not going to turn on me and kill me with that sword. I give you my weapons because we've got a covenant friendship. And I, I put on you the royal robe. I'm covenant with you. I trust you like a brother. Hallelujah. Now look at 1 Samuel chapter 20, 13 to 17. Very quickly, the covenant gets renewed. But I want you to see something here. Verse 13, but, but if my father, this is, this is, this is um, Jonathan talking, if my father, Saul, intends to harm you, David, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know, I'm going to let you know if daddy's out to get you, and I'm going to send you away in peace. And may the Lord be with you, David, as you've been, you've, you've been with my father, but 14, but show me unfailing kindness. Underline the words unfailing kindness. We're going to camp on that word in a few moments. It's a Hebrew word, hesed, H-E-S-E-D, that's been translated unfailing kindness. Show me hesed, like the Lord's hesed, as long as I live so that I may not be killed. Verse 15, don't ever cut off your hesed from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So 16. So Jonathan made this covenant, not just with David, but with the entire lineage of David, with the house of David. And Jonathan said, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him. Because he loved him as himself. Here's the bottom line. David and Jonathan had a covenant friendship that no matter what happens, I'm going to look out for you. I'm going to look out for your family. I got your back. I'm covering you. I'm protecting you. So let's now come to 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is where we're going to spend our, our meaningful last few moments in. Remember, Mephibosheth was dropped at the age of five because the nurse was going down the stone stairs at the palace, and she tripped. He's five years old, and he's royalty, and now he's crippled, and he's lame. Now, the time you go from 2 Samuel chapter 4 to 2 Samuel chapter 9, about 20 years have gone by, and Mephibosheth is now 25 years of age, and one day, 
Here's Davy. David's now King David. He's not the shepherd boy. He's now the king. And, and, and he's walking through the royal palace courtyard. And he's thinking back to the covenant of 1 Samuel 18. And he's thinking back to the covenant that was reaffirmed in 1 Samuel chapter 20. And he knows King Saul is dead. And his covenant friend Jonathan is dead. Now, re- let, me, let me read it to you. Verse 1, 2 Samuel 9. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show hesed, kindness, for Jonathan's sake. Look at verse 2. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. Everybody say Ziba. One, two, three. Ziba. And, and Ziba was summoned to appear before David. And King David said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, at your service, which means I'm here to serve. Verse 3, the king, which is David, said to Ziba, his servant, is there, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's hesed? He's remembering the covenant he made with Jonathan. Is there anybody still alive, whether it's, it's a relative of Saul or it's a, anybody, anybody connected with Jonathan? And Ziba answered the king. Now watch this. There, there's still a son of Jonathan, but notice this, he doesn't give his name. He gives his condition. He said, he's lame in both feet. You won't want him. He's just lame. He's crippled. He can't serve you. He can't be a soldier. He can't, he can't, he can't even walk. Why would you even want this, this, this crippled one from the house of, 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 of Jonathan? Why would you want him? He's, he's lame in both feet. But look at verse 4. I love this. The king, David, responded to, 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 to Ziba, where is he? And I believe that the Lord is looking down upon you and I today and you are, you are focusing on your dysfunction. You are focusing on your brokenness and you're like, I'm, I'm just crippled in my emotions. I'm, I'm just dysfunctional in my life and I'm from low to bar from a nowhere place. I'm a nothing. I've got nothing to offer the kingdom of God. I'm just like a dead dog and out of my mouth comes shame. God is speaking over your life today and he's saying, where are you? I want you. Where are you? Come on, someone give a clap offering of praise to our God. That's what God is saying. Where is he? Where is he? Verse 4, where is he? The king asked. And Ziba answered, he's at the house of Maker, the son of Amiel. This is the guy that took him in after, after the nurse had fled with him and takes him in and takes care of him. And he's now 25 years of age and he's, he's crippled as, a, as an adult living in the house. And he's living in Lo Debar, which is 70 to 80 miles outside of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. And in Lo, no, Debar thing, in a nothing place in obscurity, wanting to live out the rest of his life as a cripple. I love verse 5. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makar, the son of Amiel. He sent a chariot. He sent some servants. And he said, you get Mephibosheth and you bring him to my palace. Because I made a promise to his daddy that I'm going to show Heset to that entire family. So the chariot goes and the servant gets out and says, Mephibosheth, get into the chariot. The king wants you. And Mephibosheth says, I can't get into the chariot. I'm lame. And so the servants pick him up and they place him in the chariot. And he travels 70, 80 miles back to Jerusalem to the king. Oh, don't you miss this. The king went to great lengths pursuing Mephibosheth. He didn't care if he was crippled. He didn't care if his name meant shame. He didn't care that he talked about being a dead dog. He cared because he loved him. And the same love that King David showed Mephibosheth is the same love that God shows you. He is chasing after you. He is going after you. He's going to go to great lengths to get you in the center of God's will. He'll go to the lowest pit that you are in and get you out of it so you can see that you're a child of the living God. I rebuke low living in the name of Jesus. I'm here to declare you God, our great God's got great plans and great purposes for your life in Jesus' name. Come on, some 
everyone give a shout of praise and a loud clap offering of praise to our God in this place today? Hallelujah. Number one, the crippling fall like Mephibosheth. We're more broken than we think. The king's plan. Like Mephibosheth, we're more pursued than we can ever imagine. He's going after you because he loves you. He's not looking for you to condemn you. He's looking for you to love on you in Jesus' name. He's not looking to, to rebuke you. He's looking to redeem you. Amen. He's chasing after you because he's got a plan for you. you you've been hiding in low debar for way too long, and God is saying, get into the king's palace in Jesus' name. You've been running. You, you feel like you're a failure. There's no failures in the kingdom of God. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose for every single one in this place. The third Mephibosheth moment, very briefly, the Hesed encounter. Here's that word, Hesed. Now, let, let me define it. It's been defined in our text as kindness or goodness. But kindness or goodness is an action that flows from a character of God that he displays to us. And the character of Hesed, it's wrapped up in so many things. Let me give you a few of them. It means, it means an, a never-ending, unfailing loyalty. It's like God says, I got your back. You are covered. I am loyal to you. I'm not going to speak a bad word about you. I'm not going to stab you in the back. I'm, not, I, I'm lo- Anybody glad that our God is loyal to us? Amen? Come on, that's 10 of you. How many people are glad that our God is loyal? He's loyal. He's loyal. Jonathan and David displayed the hesed of God. They were loyal to each other. Secondly, it speaks of, un- it speaks of faithfulness, a never-ending faithfulness. God is faithful. Even when you are faithless, he is faithful. He is faithful at all times. He's not just loyal. He's not just faithful. He is a good God. He is a good God all the time. And all the time, God is good. His goodness never changes. He's good. He's loyal. And he's faithful. And it's displayed in kindness and goodness. So can I talk to you about the Hesed encounter? And I want you to get in your spirit. Like Mephibosheth, oh my goodness. We are more loved than we can ever imagine. I I tell you, I I know God loves me, but I feel the Lord wants to put a deep dose of a freshness of how much he loves. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. You think you understand it, but your view of love has been tainted by what you've walked through in life. God's love is pure, and he loves you beyond what you can ever imagine. You feel like you're in an ocean sinking, but his love is never ending. He loves you. 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 Loves you. Loves you. Loves you. Loves you. Loves you. He loves you. Oh. Hallelujah. Let me read 2 Samuel 9, 6 to 8. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who's the son of Saul, Jonathan's dead. Saul's dead. He's now in the presence of King David. He's now in the royal palace in Jerusalem. <laughs> He's no longer at Lodabar, the place of nothing. He's now in the presence of the king. And he bows down to pay him honor. And David doesn't say, you crippled one. He says, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Look at verse 7. After he announces his name, uh, he says, don't be afraid. More than any other words that came out of the mouth of Jesus are the words, fear not. And some of you today, fear has crippled you. Anxiety has crippled you. Worry has crippled you. Life has caused you to be so stuck in a rut. But God would say to you, do not be afraid. The God who is with you today is already in your tomorrow. There's nothing you're going to face tomorrow that you can't face it without the help of God. And he's saying to this place, do not fear. Take your fear to the cross and experience his peace. Give him your worry and receive his peace. Give him your anxiety and receive his peace. Do not be afraid. Come on. Someone give a clap offering of praise to our God. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. 
Verse 7, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I, I will surely show you hesed, kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Now, I don't want you to miss this. The king is speaking over Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth had a hard time receiving the hesed love of God from King David because he felt like he was a cripple from nowhere. He had nothing to offer, and all that came from his mouth was shame. And so look at verse 8. Mephibosheth bows down before the king, and he said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me. And the Hebrew word for dog is not, a, not an unclean dog that is roaming the street, but it's a dog that is living in the palace like a, like a family dog. And I don't know, we've never had a dog, but I know some of you, you got dogs in your house, and, and sometimes you'll slip a little bit of the meal off the table to the dog, and the dog will get the leftovers from your plate. The dog will get the crumbs from the bread. The dog will get what's left over from the meal. And, and Mephibosheth just said, I, I, I'm not, I'm not worthy to be a royal son of the king. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not even just a dog who only gets the crumbs. I'm a dead dog. And the king had spoken over him and said, I want to give you hesed love. And there's some of you sitting here today. King Jesus has spoken over your life. You know it in your head, but you don't get it in your heart because the devil has given you a Mephibosheth mindset that you feel like you're a nothing. You feel like you're a cripple emotionally. And you feel like you're a dead dog and you feel that shame is coming on you. God wants to break that stinking thinking in the name of Jesus. He wants to break it in the name of Jesus. The Hesed encounter, the last and probably the most important Mephibosheth moment is number four, and very briefly, the seat at the table. The seat at the table. And I want to declare to you that not only like Mephibosheth are you more broken than you think, not only are you like Mephibosheth more pursued than you think, not only are you like Mephibosheth more loved than you think, like Mephibosheth you are more privileged as a child of God than you can ever imagine. Can I show it to you in the last few moments and worship band and team, come on up, get ready, I'm almost done. I want to read verse 7. I want to read verse 9 down to verse 13. I want to bring it home. In verse 7, the king, David, said to Mephibosheth, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. <laughs> How many people know we serve a God who's in the restoration business, Amen. I said, how many people know we serve a God who's in the restoration business? He's going to restore in the name of Jesus. And then he says something that is mentioned four times in these latter verses, and it's repeated, not out of redundancy, but out of, out of prominence and emphasis. He said, and you, you always going to sit at my table. He's from low to bar. He's crippled out of the mouth of shame of Phubosheth. I'm a dead dog. I used to be royalty, but I'm not royalty. You, you got a place at my table. You, now, David had probably, some say 21 children, some say 23. And, and one of us, he had a daughter, Tamar. He had a son, Absalom. He had a son, Adonijah. He had a son, Daniel. And there's 23. And, and, and David's saying, King David's saying, King David is saying, saying, saying to Mephibosheth, you, you're part of the family. You, you're like one of mine because I made a covenant with your, with your daddy. And I'll give you, you are always welcome at my big table. You can come and eat here for breakfast. Breakfast. You can live in the palace. You can come and eat lunch and eat supper. You are always welcome at my table. You're not like a dog that only gets the crumbs. You're like one of my children. And you can feast on the food at my table. My food is your food. My table is your table. Somebody give it up for Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I want you to stand as I read these final verses. Please stand. I want you, I want you to get moved by the love of God this morning. I'm going to restore all the land that belongs to your grandfather. You're always going to eat at my table. Verse 9, then the king summoned Ziba, the servant of Saul, Saul's steward. And he said to Ziba, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. And Ziba, you and your sons and your servants, you're all going to farm the land for him. You're going to bring in the crops. You're going you're to work for him so that the master's grandson may be provided for. Uh, let me give you a spoiler alert. These last few verses are about a place, a position, and about provision. <laughs> it's like David was saying, Mephibosheth, you've got a place to live, and it's no longer in Lodabar. It's no longer in a place of nothing. You're welcome to be in Jerusalem, in my palace, and at the king's table. You've got a place to live, and you've got a position like you're one of my sons, and you've got provision. I'll make sure all your needs are met. Anybody glad today we got a place at the king's table? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got a place. You've got a position. You've got provision. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Now, it's in brackets, the latter part of verse 10. <laughs> Don't miss it. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's a lot of boys, and that's a lot of servants, and they're all going to work on behalf of Mephibosheth and farm the land. How many people know God's got a lot of angels in heaven working on your behalf? Amen. He's got a lot working on your behalf. Verse 11, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. <laughs> Here it is again. Third time, so Mephibosheth ate at David's, David's table, just like one of the king's sons. <laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> You're not a cripple. You're royalty. I said, you're not a cripple. You're royalty. Oh. oh, I can't wait. I got to tell you this before I read these final verses. Now, my, my dear wife, she set the table for we had the early Thanksgiving dinner last night, and she set a beautiful table. But, but in our home, she, we, bring up, we bring up the little insert for the table because we need a lot of room at the table for our family. And, and, and she puts a tablecloth over it. My, she puts this big tablecloth over it. I want you to picture it's breakfast time. It's, and, and Eamon gets up and he comes to the table. And Absalom comes up and gets to the table. And, and, and Daniel gets up and comes to the table. And Adonijah gets up and comes to the table. And Mephibosheth can't get out of bed. So the boys lift him up and they help bring this 25 year old man who's crippled to the table. Oh, to the crippled to the table. And he sits at the table with the tablecloth would cover his crippleness. I wonder, I know it doesn't say it in the text. It doesn't say there's a tablecloth. But if there was a tablecloth, the tablecloth represents the grace of God. And the grace of God covers you. Covers you. <laughs> because of grace you can't look at your crippleness anymore <laughs> he didn't look down and see his crippledness he didn't see Lodabar he's in the king's who did he see sitting at the table King David and who do we fix our eyes on right now King Jesus come on come on someone give it up for Jesus it's Jesus it's Jesus it's Jesus oh out of part of verse 11, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. We're almost done. Verse 12. <laughs> there's more. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's more. He often missed this. Mephibosheth had a young son. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's Micah or Mika. And scholars debate that, but he had a boy. <sighs> and Micah's at the table with daddy. Come on, there's more. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And 13 wraps it up. And Mephibosheth lived at a place in Jerusalem, at the king's palace, because he always ate at the king's table. Oh, yeah. He's lame in both feet, whatever. Whatever. I declare you're not a cripple. You're a royal son of daughter of the king of kings and the lord of lords. If God is for you, who can be against you? <sighs> Pastor Brad. 
There's an anointing. I couldn't get it. I, I had to text this man. Yes, I said, it's in my head. It's in my heart. Everywhere I'm driving. And I, I'm at hospitals yesterday. I'm driving through some of the, 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 the dirtiest areas of our city and the most desperate areas of our city. And I, I started to weep because I knew these were some of the areas we're going to adopt and we're going to help in the days ahead. And all I thought is Jesus loves these people. I'm driving down some of the streets in downtown Ottawa, and there's drug addicts, and there's alcoholics, and people with no home walking through the streets. God, you love them. You love them. You love them. You love them. Most of them were just like you and me and had a rock deal in life. Don't judge them in Jesus' name. God, help us to show the hesed love of God to the city. But I believe before we can show the hesed love of God to the city, we need a good dose of the hesed love of God to us. So come on, all across this place, lift your hands right now. God, I pray as Pastor Brad begins to lead us in this song that I can't get out of my spirit. Wrap your loving arms around us. God, there's people standing here today because of what they're going through. They're questioning your hesed love. I pray that it would move from their head to their hearts that, God, we wouldn't live any longer in Lodabar, but we'd be seated at the table in the presence of our King of kings and Lord of lords. No more shame in the name of Jesus. I said no more shame in the name of Jesus. No more shame in the name of Jesus. We are dead dogs. We are children of the living God. And you love us. So come on, church, with all you got. With all you got, sing about the love of God. Let the love of God overwhelm you right now. Go ahead, Pastor, lead us in the song. He is jealous of me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath. The weight of his wind and mercy When all of the sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for I want you to get into your spirit today that he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither depths, nor heights, nor angels, nor demons. He loves you. He loves you. He is jealous of me. He loves like a
drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. My heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about it. Come on, sing that again. So we are his portion, he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all singing. Yeah. So heaven meets earth like a non foreseen kiss. My heart turns bodily inside of my chest. Oh, I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way. Everyone's eyes are closed. Just a couple of moments, we're going to celebrate communion. But I want you to hear me. God loves you so much. That over 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus, just for you. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's you and me. They put him on a cross. He died. On the third day, God the Father raised him to life. And he lives. And the reason why he went to the cross was for your sins and my sins, for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. A question for every one of you in this place on sight and everyone that's watching online. If today was the day that you died, you stepped into eternity, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Because you will live forever one of two places, heaven or hell. Hell is real. Heaven is real. We don't want to hear that hell is real, but it's real. And hell is the place for those who have rejected Jesus. Heaven is the place for those that receive Him. Was there a time, was there a place, was there a moment that you said, Jesus, come into my life? You can't buy your salvation. You can't give enough. You can't read your Bible enough. You can't go to church enough. It's by grace you are saved. You're standing here today and you're like, I, I'm not ready for heaven. I've never made that decision, but today I want to. Or you're standing here today, you're like, I did years ago, but I'm, I'm, I'm so lost, but I'm here today and I want to settle it. In just a moment, I'm not going to be labored. I'm going to count to three. In just a moment, I'm going to do that. If you're standing here today and you're like, I'd like to be led in a prayer to invite Jesus to be the center of my life, to receive this forgiveness of sins. I want him in my life. I want to be ready for heaven. I want to be led in this prayer all across this place. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. And if you'd like to be included and led in this prayer, I want to invite you as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, just to simply and quickly and quietly lift up your hand. You can put it down. And we're going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. So let's do this. One, two, three. If that's you and you're like, I want to be led in that prayer, just lift your hand as high as you can all across this place. I'm seeing hands going up in the riser, hands going up in the balcony, hands on the main level, all across this auditorium, way over in the risers and way up in the balcony. I see your hands. I see your hands. You can put your hands down. If you lifted your head, can I lead you in this prayer? something we do every Sunday morning. We, we want to join you as you pray. So we're going to pray together. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come, into my life. come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Of my sins. I have decided, I have decided to, follow Jesus. to follow Jesus. I make my peace with you. I, make my peace with you. I want to live for you I want to live and serve you all the days of my life. All the days of my life. I pray this now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Come on, open your eyes. Can we do a little celebration? Come on, we do a little celebration. Amen. Amen. Now look this way. If you prayed that prayer, you made the best decision of your life in about four minutes when this service comes to a close. Go to the table in the lobby. We want to give you a Bible. We're going to tell you we can help you in your new faith journey. We've got lots to support you and help you. And if you don't attend a life-giving Bible-believing church, honestly, we'd be honored if you joined us in the journey. When you came in today, you received a little package with emblems. Could you pull that out? If you didn't receive one, I think there's going to be some ushers roaming through. I trust that's happening. And just they'll make sure you get one. But could you peel back that upper layer and get ready with the wafer? The Bible teaches us that we're to remember what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago, 2,000 plus years ago. And we're to reflect, reflect our own lives and we're to look ahead to the return of Jesus and so may we never forget anybody glad that Jesus came and died if you're glad say amen I said if you're glad say amen to think that he the sinless one took your place and my place he paid a debt he did not owe and we owe a debt we could never pay but only Jesus could take our place amen Let's partake together of the wafer that represents his body. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Just peel back that next layer. I know it's a little trickier to get that next layer. Just put your nail in there. It'll work. for the blood of Jesus. Do you know blood represents life? And Jesus gave his life for you and for me. But death, I said death couldn't hold him in the ground. Up from the grave he arose. Amen. Let's partake of the juice. Come on, let's partake of it. that down I want us to give such a loud shout of praise and clap offering of gratitude for what Jesus come on for what Jesus has done he loves you he loves you he loves you he loves you I want the altar workers to come immediately. Pastors and board and altar workers, please come and make yourself ready. In just a moment, Pastor Brad's gonna lead us in a little bit of that song. And we, we love giving opportunity for people to, to come for prayer. If you're standing here today and you're like, I'd love someone to pray over me. We've got a great team of people. We believe Jesus still heals, amen. We believe nothing is impossible with God. We'd love to pray for you. Whatever your need, there's someone at this altar that would love to pray for you. And just, just hold tight for just a few more moments. I've got some important things to share at the end. But if you'd like prayer, I want you to come as we sing a little bit of this song. And we'd love to pray for you. If you need prayer, come on forward. And we'd love to pray for you. Just sing a little bit, Pastor, if you will. So we are his portion. He is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So have you been terrified? Not for seas. My heart turns bodily inside of my
so unconditionally. If you've come to the altar, wait. Someone's going to come and pray for you. In 30 seconds, I'm going to close in prayer. And if you need to go, go with God's grace and blessing. And if you accepted Jesus, you made the best decision of your life. Drop by the table in the lobby. We want to give you a Bible. We want to tell you we can help you in your new faith journey. If you're a guest, drop by the table. We want to bless you. Church family, if you've come prepared to give on site, there's buckets in the back, debit machines in the lobby. All our giving options are on signs in the lobby, and you can go on the website. I'm so glad that you joined us today. So God, I thank you for everyone that's joined us on site and online. Move us and overwhelm us with the fact that you love us and you are pursuing us. And we're so privileged. We have a seat at the table. And I pray, God, that you would bless each one. I pray for everyone who's come to the altar that you would meet them and do a great work. God, I pray next Sunday on Thanksgiving weekend, the word that you put in my heart, help me to declare it. That God, the vision just to expand the hesed love of God to some hurting areas of our city. Help us, God. Help us, God. Thank you for this great church. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for what you're about to do. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Everybody's sad. Amen. Amen. Amen.